Hello everyone, this is Savannah Bekkowski, Project Assistant at the Syracuse University Environmental Finance Center. On behalf of the Environmental Finance Center Network, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar entitled, Ask the Expert on Asset Management. To give you all of an idea of where others on the webinar are tuning in from, we have prepared this map. You can see that we have attendees spread all throughout the country and the globe. Thanks to you all for joining us today. This session is one of several webinars conducted by the Environmental Finance Center Network for the Smart Management for Small Water Systems Project. The EFCN provides training and technical assistance to small public waters in all 50 states and five territories to help local water systems achieve and maintain compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act. And here you can see the various centers that make up the Environmental Finance Center Network. You can see that we have centers spread all across the country. And here are the areas of expertise that the EFCN focuses on. Workshops, trainings, and direct technical assistance are pro provided on a variety of topics, including, but not limited to, asset management, leadership through decision making and communication, energy management planning, workforce development, collaborating with other water systems, resiliency planning, and managing drought. The EFCN also provides a small systems blog. You can learn more about water finance and management through this blog. Blog posts feature lessons learned from our trainings and technical assistance, descriptions of available tools, and small system success stories. You will have an opportunity to subscribe to this blog at the end of the webinar. In addition to the workshops, direct technical assistance, and webinars, as part of the Smart Management for Small Water Systems project, we are also creating a table that lists the major funding sources for drinking water infrastructure projects in each state and territory. And here's how you can access those tables. From the EFCN homepage, go to the Resources tab, and then click on Funding Sources by State. This will take you to a map of the country. If you click on the state you're interested in, you will find a PDF table of the relevant funding sources for the drinking water infrastructure in that state. The table looks like the image on the left-hand side of the slide. For each funding program, it includes the name of the program, a short description, and contact information for someone who works in the program. Now at this point, I would like to turn the presentation over to our experts for today. For our webinar today, we have Heather Himmelberger, Director of the Southwest Environmental Finance Center, and Ross War, Founder of War Infrastructure Management and an Asset Management and Systems Integration Specialist. Heather and Ross, welcome and take it away. Thank you, Savannah, and I'm so delighted to have my good friend and colleague Ross here with me today. Ross is from New Zealand, and as Savannah mentioned, he's been doing asset management for about, what, 20 years now? I think so. Yeah. And he uh, just knows everything there is to know about asset management, so we're delighted to have him here today. And I want to make uh, mention again of the chat box, so please, if you have any questions as we go along, please type them into the chat box. We'd like to make this as much about your questions as we possibly can. We wanted to start out by talking to Ross about um, an incident that just recently happened in New Zealand and how that impacts on asset management. And then we'll check to see if there's any questions that have come in. We have a couple of other topics we can talk about in the meantime. Uh, but please, again, as you um, get a question, please type it in the box. Any aspect with asset management. We're happy to take a stab at answering all of your questions. Well, thank you, Heather. And um, just over in New Zealand in the last, uh, about a year ago, uh, it was just over a year ago, we had a, a very, very serious for us uh, water contamination incident. Um, Havelock North is a, a reasonably affluent town in a, in a quite a uh, strong agricultural dist, uh, area. And um, the, they had uh, a well that uh, the water was uh, getting drawn into. Uh, in New Zealand, we had at the time, which is in the process of changing, uh, the concept of what was called a secure supply, which uh, in hindsight was a bit optimistic. Um, and this particular well, through a whole set of circumstances, ended up uh, drawing um, water into the well from uh, uh, an area that had been contaminated by sheep. Um, and 5,000 people came down with Campylobacter. Um, there were around about three people died, sort of, they were sick or, or unwell, but it was sort of a secondary cause type thing. Um, there'll be roughly 100 people still got health conditions as a result of that. Uh, we have ended up with a, a, a very, very serious high-level government inquiry that is still ongoing uh, around that. Um, 
Now, the, the council or the municipality that looked at that was supplies a client of mine. Um, I've been helping them in behind the scenes uh, with their responses to that. And the interesting thing from an asset management point of view is asset management um, develops at three levels. You have the strategic asset management that's looking out at high level policy um, and longer term planning. Um, they were very good at that, still are. Uh, you have the, the intermediate tactical level asset management planning, which is more around asset management plan writing. Um, it's around the condition of the assets and it's around um, asset management uh, pipe replacement or re rehabilitation or those sorts of things. And again, they were doing really well with that. Uh, their risk management in that space at the time was be as good as anybody in New Zealand for that type, for the for the you know critical assets and replacing pipes and things like that. And then at the at the bottom level of or, or at the base of the asset management pyramid is the operations and maintenance and the and the managing the assets on a daily basis. And they had some operational failures or, or uh, issues. I think would be a better way of putting it. Um, and um, what, it, what it showed to, to me and why we thought we'd start with it is you can have really good asset management plans in place, you can have really good long-term strategies in place, and you can still have an operational failure that, that really, really hurts you and um, the quality of your water in your community, uh, be that via a well as this case or a contamination issue as you're doing a repair or, or whatever it is. Um, and so, you know, your operations and your maintenance of your system are still really, really vital within the, the overall asset management context. And no amount of good planning will help you if you don't have the, the right training for your staff or the right processes or procedures right down at that, that field crew level. Um, the other thing, and this is something that we do a lot of in asset management planning, is we're making a lot of assumptions. So we're assuming that, in their case, they assumed the well was secure and the groundwater was pure, and both of those assumptions were incorrect. Uh, they lived in, that, that particular area has had exceptionally good groundwater um, for 150 years. Um, but I think what's happening now is we really look at it and there's been multiple millions of dollars uh, spent on mapping groundwater since and the purity is that the agricultural intensity in the area is that groundwater is not as pure as people thought it was um, and it's just changing the entire view of, uh, of what you do and I was talking to Heather about this earlier in the week and we were talking about multiple barriers for wells of contamination and um, our, our legislation and regulations in New Zealand uh, will be changing to that quite quickly, I think, over the next uh, a few months. But um, anyway, the, 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 the thing, the point from an asset management point of view is if you run on an assumption that is incorrect, it's going to hurt you at some stage. And that might be an assumption like, like this particular municipality made about, around the security of their well. It could be an assumption around the condition of your pipes and how long they're going to last. Um, a, a real simple one is if your pipes are, only, are in poor condition, you don't know, and they're only going to last 80 years, and you've assumed that they're going to last 300 years, that's an assumption that's going to hurt you financially at some stage and service delivery wise. So I just thought a good place to start, um, just by people thinking about questions and uh, something that from our country's point of view was never a place we wanted to be. No water supply asset manager or engineer ever comes to work on a Monday morning wanting to have 5,000 people sick by the end of the week um, and, uh, and certainly doesn't want the paperwork that follows on from that. Um, now the team that were involved in that have, you know, they've, for the last year they've just put an effort above and beyond to get everything right again, but it was too late. You know, the, the mistake and the assumption was made. And I just thought you in America here, you probably haven't heard about that one, but um, it's just some basic lessons like those lessons out of Flint, some really basic lessons that we can all apply to our asset management practices. And it also reminds us that, you know, we do have to make assumptions in our asset management planning. I mean, that's that goes without saying that there's no way you can know everything, but to check those assumptions periodically. Yeah. So as we're going along and we make these assumptions, like, for example, Ross mentioned the pipe lasting, you know, say we think it might last 80 years or 100 years or, or you know, 150 years. And checking those assumptions over time, so as we're getting closer to 80 years, does it look like 80 is going to work, or does it look like 60 is more like it, or 120 is more like it? Yeah. So checking those assumptions periodically instead of just leaving them in there forever 
and never going back to see if, you know, we're right or we're wrong, because you have to start somewhere, but we kind of want to circle back, I think, and look at some of these assumptions. Yeah, it's validating those assumptions, and, you know, we're, we're in a uh, science and even evidence-based profession, um, and so whilst you do have to make assumptions while you're doing your initial planning, uh, practice would say you're going to go and find some evidence to support that assumption or alter it at some stage. It's, it's pretty basic stuff. And uh, I think sometimes we, we write our asset plan and we get on with our programs and life get busy and we just forget to circle back, as you said, Heather, and, and um, validate those assumptions. So, Great. Uh, Savannah, do you know if there's any questions that have come in yet? Yeah, so we did receive one question and it was asking if the system was chlorinated. <laughs> we wish it was. Um, it, there's a couple of large systems or that particular area and, and um, another area, one of our major cities, where they've had such good groundwater for such a long time um, that they have, the communities have made the decision that they don't want chlorination and our federal government hasn't enforced it as a regulation. Um, and there's just a major debate going on across New Zealand and in, in our profession and with the regulators at the moment about whether there should be mandatory um, residuals. Uh, there used to be. Um, it's sort of one of those things where everybody got a bit um, annoyed. People don't like chemicals and, and the water supply and those people are particularly vocal in the community um, and there's just a, a very large conversation around um, public health versus public preference, shall we say. And uh, one of, you know, in, in asset management, one of the things that you do is you sit down and work out service levels. So for a water utility, you would go, yes, we want to provide um, safe water, we want to provide, uh, it, it tastes nice, and it's, we want to provide enough of it, a good quantity of it, uh, at the right pressure perhaps. Um, those sorts of things, but what, what we found out of, out of this Havelock North incident is that your number one service level is don't kill people. Um, provide water that's safe. Um, house is, is secondary to that, and it's, you know, the, back in New Zealand, and I'm sure the case was in the 50s and 60s in, in the States as well, uh, a, a public water engineer would, would be called a public health engineer. Uh, that was the focus, was getting public health, uh, primary health. And I think we in New Zealand now we're refocusing ourselves on remembering that uh, water and wastewater systems are about protecting public health in the first instance. And maybe that's going to change the cost structure a little bit to make sure that we, we really have that covered off. And it's something that um, has come up a lot in the work that we've done in asset management is the idea of level of service. And level of service is a big part of asset management, but it's often one that utilities want to ignore and want to downplay as not as important as the other four components of asset management. And incidents like this, or even Flint, Michigan, in my opinion, drive home that message that level of service is vitally important because had, say, a, a community like Flint put first and foremost the public health of the community is absolutely the number one thing, not the money, not switching sources, the number one thing is the public health of that community, I think they might have made different choices. So we do need to have that level of service be, you know, a key factor for all of our communities and looking at public health as a huge part of that public ser level of service. And that, that Havelock community, the water is currently being chlorinated. They'd done a risk assessment before the incident, years before, and said, hey, we could get contaminated water. They had chlorination injection points at every single one of their wells. The trouble is, once you get um, uh, contamination in water, your sampling's not continuous on online, usually. Well, in New Zealand it isn't. Um, and so it was too late. They, they, the horse had already bolted in, return, in, in terms of that. The really interesting thing is that town wants the chlorine out of the water even after a third of the town being sick, you know, lots of uh, children being sick, old people dying, they still don't want chlorine in their water. Um, and, they're, and, the, and the municipality has had to provide one well with a tap where people can go and fill up their water uh, without chlorine in it. And you go, well, that's a, that's a conversation and a, and a communication between the regulators and the municipality and the community to say, really we can't guarantee the safety of the water uh, without some sort of uh, disinfectant residual and chlorine still about the best way of doing that, I think. So, 
Savannah, do we have any other questions or we'll move on to a different topic if we don't? We do have two more questions, and my apologies if the first part of this question is a repeat, but an attendee asked if the was a sanitary well survey conducted, and are daily bacteria tests run on this system? Right, so um, there was some, when I was referring to operational issues, um, that, that particular, it's a long story, like, like there is, um, uh, East light folders from the floor to the ceiling or boxes of, of evidence around this. Um, they had done well surveys but they hadn't done one recently and they'd had previous problems with that well and like 20 years ago and it had been overlooked. And they knew that the well wasn't as good as it could be. They'd put a new one in. Um, it had got some contamination in it so they'd closed that off and gone back to the old one. So it was a whole, it's like um, these things, it's like we've ended up with that Swiss cheese analogy that you've got to get all the holes to line up for something to be a problem. And in this particular case, they'd had the warning shots. Um, they'd got lost in the in the history of the municipality. People had forgotten about them, and ultimately all the holes lined up, and you know you can turn the lock and and the things unsafe. Um, our previous water regulations required testing every second or third day. Um, since the incident, everybody's been testing daily. Um, but we actually haven't had the labs available to, to do that level of testing. So there's a whole, another stream as part of the government, um, the federal inquiry essentially, saying, hey, do we need to have daily testing or even more frequent than that uh, um, in these situations? And that's still a, a conversation that's ongoing. Um, because obviously it poses a different level of cost on the communities as well, particularly very small communities. So, okay, Good so, question, so. Uh, Savannah, I think you said there was one more? Yeah, so um, an attendee asks, do you utilize a CMMS to manage your assets? If so, is it GIS based? They're talking about a computerized maintenance yeah, management yeah. system. And so I think um, let's assume for this particular community and then generalize it oh, to right. other places. So every, every community in New Zealand has been doing asset management now for nearly 20 years. Um, everybody has inventories. Everybody has computerized maintenance management system. This particular authority or municipality also had optimized decision-making um, analysis system at really at the cutting edge of practice in New Zealand and really pushing the envelope. So all of that side of, side of it, they were really on top of um, in terms of pipe replacement, um, all of that sort of stuff. But what, what had happened is the wells had become a little bit invisible in that system um, and they, they just had the, the inventory information but they for a whole heap of reasons, and it was to do with personnel and stuff like that as well. They weren't getting um, the maintenance history and the inspection history for the wells into the system. Um, they had it right, right down, just about every other part of the assets they owned, they had that going, but just not for the wells for some particular reasons. And, and um, they, they had a lot of uh, like electrical and, and uh, they had skater on the wells for the pumps and the high levels, all of that sort of good stuff. Uh, but there were some gaps that were showing up to be quite um, deficient at the end of the day and were criticised quite broadly by the inquiry. So, yeah. So, so again, you can have a system, but if one particular part of the organisation decides not to use it or to use it infrequently, um, that can create problems for you. And and, and sometimes it's uh, it come. This is this is why I was sort of on the slide there. I have operational issues, um, and uh, the. Sometimes, you know, someone says, I'm not doing it, and you go, well, are we going to are we gonna fire them? They're, locked. They're a really, really good hands-on operator. They know their job. Oh, we'll just live with it sort of thing, you know, and, and this is where you open the door to this sort of stuff. Um, it would be fair to say that's all changed in the last year. They now have very, very rigorous record-keeping around wells and other things, but again, it's, it's a little bit late for that particular town. Okay, let's move on to a different topic. Um, oops. So what I want to talk a little bit about <clears throat> is a theme that's coming up in a couple of different areas. I'm starting to hear it in relationship to uh, companies, uh, you know, private companies and asset management. And then I was recently at a conference in Australia that was talking about asset management and the same theme came up. And it is something that we run into a lot with utilities here in the U.S. So I wanted to bring up this topic 
And the topic is asset management versus managing assets. And it might sound like those two things are exactly the same. And, you know, what would be the difference between managing assets versus asset management? But they're actually quite different. There's actually quite, um, quite a difference between the strategic direction, which is asset management. So we're talking about leadership, communication, the strategic direction of the overall program. You know, what are you trying to accomplish with your entire program, setting these level of service goals, looking at risk, seeing risk as, as the bigger picture of I'm investing in the items of my inventory that have the greatest risk and I'm managing it as a whole. And then when we talk about managing assets, that's what we do to an individual asset. So the operation and maintenance that we do for an individual asset. So if we're going to do maintenance on a hydrant or a well or a pump, that is managing that asset. And what we start to see when people maybe initially take on asset management or haven't thought deeply enough is that they get really hung up in the managing assets part uh, rather than the asset management piece. So we want to make sure that, you know, while managing assets is important and we don't want to say, we don't want to imply that that's not true. I mean, it is definitely important that we do our our maintenance work, our operation work, we're doing all those things. We want to also get above that and say we still need that strategic direction. We still need the governing body to engage in asset management, engage in that whole strategic process. We need the communication to go back and forth between customers and, and uh, elected leaders, customers and the utility, uh, the operation and maintenance folks and the leadership. There has to be this bigger picture. So, Russ, um, do you have any thoughts from your yeah. perspective in New Zealand of this idea of asset management versus managing assets? Yeah, and and um, again, just uh, just for our attendees as well, if you put Havelock North Water Incident New Zealand into Google, you will find thousands and thousands of pages of reading if you if you really interested in running it down a little bit more and informing yourself. There's, it's <laughs> it's been a big inquiry and it's still ongoing. Um, and look. This topic is part of that as well because they were, at the end of the day, they, they I think, were quite light on operational staff and they had been in a, in a uh, we, went, we need to save money had been the message from the governments and from the management and so they were making do and that's managing assets and at, a, at the larger picture, the asset management, they were doing some of it well but, but what's happened now is you've gone from trying to save pennies and, and for a town that size or well, the, the wider um, communities like about 70,000 people, they're going to be spending about $50 million to solve that problem in the space of two years. Um, now the good news is that the entire um, municipality has agreed that the money needs to be spent and they're going to go away and borrow the money for a long period of time and pay it off and all those sorts of things. But the, losing sight of both either thing uh, either managing the assets at an individual level, so in that case managing those wells, uh, they were shy on resources and not keeping good enough records and all those sorts of things, and the alarm bells didn't go off. Um, the that, that side of it can create you huge issues if you don't do it well and, and do it um, thoroughly, but at the same time, if you don't do your asset management, if you get the settings wrong, if you've got everything screwed down too much, you're not spending enough money on asset, on pipe rehabilitation or replacement, or you're not spending enough money on growth areas or um, or new tanks or what it, or well replacement or um, even just planning that, you you can end up in a situation where you create a whole heap of expense and problems just because you haven't looked forward far enough, and you end up wasting a lot of money and. Also, just responding to managing assets because your assets start breaking and, and problems and you you can end up what we call New Zealand firefighting where you're just rushing out in, in trucks with, with uh, you know, sirens going and, and lights flashing, doing a great job of fixing the problem, but you're actually just burning money. You might as well just get a pile of money and burn it because that's basically what you're doing to maintain the service as as, a, as opposed to getting ahead of that by planning a little bit more thoroughly and going, hey, we've got some really old pipe that's, that's all going to break soon. Let's get in ahead. Let's, let's, um, it's in the last five or seven years of its life and, and let's plan and do that in a, 
at a time that we're going to get a good price for it and in a way that we can do it that is going to be cost effective and we can still maintain the great service that we want to maintain. So. Because yeah, I think a lot of times as operators and managers, we just really get hung up on those, you know, those tasks that we have to do because that's what's staring in our face day to day. You know, oh, I got to go out and, you know, exercise valves. I have to go out and flush hydrants. You know, you get really focused in on those individual assets and what has to happen with those. And sometimes we forget to step back and take that bigger look of, well, how does that hydrant fit into the overall program? Or how does the valve program fit into that? <clears throat> Is there a way to look at that valve exercising program in a more strategic way? Uh, which valves are we exercising? When are we exercising those valves? How are we doing it? So that it's part of a bigger picture rather than just the activities we do just during that day. And I think a classic example of that a few years ago, um, one of the larger urban municipalities in New Zealand got me to look at, um, they were rewriting a service delivery contract with a, a contractor and I, I had a look at all the schedules and they had these pump station inspections every single day. And this was for wastewater. Two pump stations, so there was redundancy and they had skate on every single pump station and they had um, lots of alarms and lots of lots of diagnostics of what was going on. I said to them, why are you visiting every day? And they said, well, because we always have. Um, and always have was like 30 or 40 years ago because that was before SCADA. And, and they, um, I said, well, you know, do you, let's have a look at the records. And they were getting no problems with these. Um, they were cleaning them once a week. I said, well, maybe we could go to once a week. I said, oh, oh, that's scary. Um, but sometimes stepping back out, like Heather was just talking about, allows you to have another look at things and say, well, do we, do we really need to do that? And sometimes you do. And sometimes you go, well, we're really over-servicing this quite badly or um, stuff like that. And Or sometimes it's just a completely different way of doing things. So you can go... And going back to Havelock again, they're now going to go to a couple of big bore uh, wells in this in a different location where there's good water, and then completely reconfigure the network. That's where the fifty million bucks is going. But um, the they had it got locked into just doing the same thing in the same place with wells where they had contam. You know, we now know they had badly bad risk of contamination. Um, sometimes you can step back, do that big picture asset management and strategic direction and go, you know, we could work on something that's quite different that will deliver a much better result to our community over a longer period of time. Um, if you're just managing assets, you'll never do that thinking. You'll just fix whatever it is in front of you um, and nothing changes. And one thing that we notice, um, even with um, bigger utilities, so the larger end of small, let's say, um, you have a tendency to want to manage the assets you can see a lot more than managing the assets you can't see. So again, as you get on the bigger picture of the asset management side, that allows you to look at those ones you can't see in the context of the whole because we, you know, it's human nature. It's a whole lot easier to deal with something that you can touch, you can feel, you can see. So we'll see sometimes over maintaining certain assets and under maintaining others because you can't see the well very well, you can't see the pipe, you know, so valves to some extent, they're underground. So it's sometimes we spend more time looking at pumps that we can touch and see and hydrants and things like that and then maybe ignore, you know, what's happening in our pipe network, what's happening in our wells, uh, which sounds a little bit like the case we were talking about in New Zealand, but it's certainly I've seen other utilities along those lines where we're, we're spending a whole lot more time looking at one type of asset than another, and sometimes we'll even see the O&M they're doing on those assets that they can touch, like pump stations, they're spending a lot of time on, let's say, less important activities, so maybe um, some groundskeeping. You know, not to say that's not important at all, but if you have a well that's going to get contaminated, it's certainly more important than the groundkeeping around the pump station. So we would find cases where there's lots and lots of hours spent on groundskeeping, but we're completely ignoring another asset. So just when you get up to the bigger picture of the asset management, that allows you to take a look at where am I spending my time? Am I sort of over 
maintaining some assets, under maintaining others, am I keeping a, a balanced look at what's going on in my system? So again, just the difference, they're both important aspects, but just the difference, you know, keeping in mind the difference of the two and how they work together and how you can't have one without the other uh, because you'll get out of whack. You know, you're not going to do what you need to do if you're doing one and not the other. Yeah, I think I think the other thing is I've I've been involved with the municipality that runs that um, Havelock Supply, and we we looked at the the resourcing, the staff resourcing, and the and also the capability, the the training and stuff like that. And that would have been really really nice if we'd done that exercise two years ago or three years ago, and uh, they'd actually might have got over uh, ahead of that problem. Um, they, they're going to be hiring more resources, particularly in the operations area. Um, and, yeah, so sometimes you can just get into this little phase where you, you everybody wants you to save money and you don't replace people as they leave or um, somebody with a lot less experience comes on when you've just had somebody with 30 or 40 years experience has left. And you can end up quite vulnerable um, without because you haven't had a look at the bigger picture and said, hey, what's that doing to us, the staffing and... Um, What's the loss of experience doing to us in terms of our risk profile? And sometimes it changes, and it, that's, again, just stepping back and having a bit more of a holistic view of that. And, and you can then go back up to your management and your uh, governance decision makers and say, hey, maybe we need a period of cover while we, we, we manage these risks and, and get some short-term or some medium-term resources or um, some external resources to, to make sure you don't end up um, having having worked with these guys for the last year and seeing the the you know the pain that they've gone through in terms of trying to make things right, um, I can tell you for sure you never want to be there in your career. Uh, it's not a, it's not a happy place for any any water or waste or engineer to be. Um, and sometimes that requires painful and hard conversations with senior managers and with, with governors uh, to say, look, we, we're cutting it too fine and we're not spending enough money and if we carry on like this, something's going to break bad. Uh, and then it's a matter of defining that a whole lot more and that's where you can go and collect some evidence and, and check those assumptions and, and uh, just provide a bit more um, robustness to the request for additional resources or funding. Uh, Savannah, I wanted to do a check-in with you, see if we've had any questions or comments that have come in. Of course. So we do have two questions lined up. And the first one does relate back to the uh, New Zealand water system. And this attendee asked if that contamination of the water system was preceded by an unusual rain event. Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. It well, was, no. Uh, it was it was um, it was preceded by a few things, but yes, there was a, a big rain event uh, a couple of um, a, a week or so beforehand. Um, they twenty years ago they'd had a similar sort of cir uh, range of circumstances, um, and there was a pathway between a pond that was in the paddock uh, to the well. It was what what it all worked out at the end, and they'd known about it and forgotten about it. Um, and on it goes. It was like, as I said, the Swiss cheese thing. They should never have reactivated that bore they, or that well. They knew it was. They knew it was sort of wasn't as good as it could have been, and they were just too busy doing other stuff. And uh, but one one of the things also that's come out of that, and this all just coming back to the operations and maintenance thing here, there is you can get too familiar with your assets. And you can run around and do stuff like the the painting or the busy work or the grounds right. work and just don't see the problem because you're not looking for it. And um, even with safety of ladders going up onto uh, tanks and stuff like that, you know, they can get quite rusted or the bolts are loose or, and people just don't see it because they go up it every what day or every week or whatever. Um, and it's just human nature, I think. But, but it's something you've really got to watch out for that you just become blind to the problems because you sort of see them every day and they're not really, your mind's switched off them being a problem. And again, I think sometimes coming in at that, that next level up, the, the planning level, the strategic level, and having a having a or an audit, so what we call them an audit, you know, so you'll do a process audit or a, um, a, a service delivery audit or whatever it is and just get another set of eyes on it and sometimes it shows up 
hopefully before they happen, problems that are, are sitting there waiting for you just because people sort of stop seeing them. Um, and particularly in treatment plants, tanks, pumps, I think that's where wells, that, uh, that's where those sorts of things can be quite prevalent. Uh, and I wonder with Flint, there might have been a bit of that as well. You know, oh, they, they, they just forgot about the fact they had lead. You know, everybody knew, but they sort of forgot. And, um, yeah. Thank you, Can you have a second question? Yes. So um, an attendee commented that you both have done a great job talking about the need for strategic direction and leadership. Now they asked, is it possible that there are too many federal regulations and they steal time and financial resources that reduce oh, and reduce asset management? For example, requiring small villages um, nutrient reduction even though they do not contribute much. Uh, this is a loaded question, is it not? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah. Uh, it is one of those things that I think becomes part of the overall strategic asset management approach that while we have these regulations in place and we are, are, are compelled, I guess the word I'll use, compelled to comply with them, we have to build that in as part of the overall strategy that we're trying to adopt. So. I think there's probably parallel paths, and one path is there are regulations that, um, how should I put this, um, appear to make sense to the people making the regulations up, but in the grand scheme of things, if they could step back, may have a different opinion. So I think the one that was mentioned sounds like a nutrient removal, and I'm guessing that's a wastewater situation where their wastewater treatment plant is discharging into some receiving body that probably is is having a nitrogen phosphorus control where we have the uh, farm agricultural areas that are actually most likely contributing more. Yeah, we have and, the same issues. Yeah. And the regulations generally are on the ones that are easier to regulate, which are the point sources or the wastewater treatment plants, as opposed to the non-point sources, which would be your agricultural areas. So, you know, I understand the concern and I feel your pain in some of these areas, but on the other hand, we, what we have to do is kind of build that into the overarching asset management plan and figure out a way to make that part of our level of service part of what we do and how we overall manage our assets as opposed to a se separate kind of um, thing that we look at as taking away from asset management, I would say it is part of the overarching asset management and the more you can integrate that into your program through levels of service and, and looking at critical assets, you know, what assets are critical to, you know, removing the nitrogen phosphorus and, and even taking the step back to say, is there a way to work with agricultural areas? You know, maybe the government can't mandate certain things, but perhaps you could get together with, you know, agricultural areas. Is there a way to work with them to have them change some practices, you know, in a voluntary way? You know, so as a strategic direction, can you bring a different conversation in with your customers and the local, you know, farmers to have a different conversation about maybe we can change how you, you know, put nutrients on your fields or, you know, do you have buffer zones or do we have you well, know, that, capture zones or whatever? Certainly one of the learnings out of the, the Havelock water incident is that um, particularly for, for public water supply, you're going to have to control the uh, right from, you know, the, the buffer and, the, and the, the collection zone right through the well, right through to uh, the whole system and I think we've had that very well reinforced to us in, in New Zealand and that's going to create issues around some of the well fields and some of the municipalities. But I think the other thing, and, and it's a wider question, but that's why I said it was a very good question, the, the, the thing that's happening is every 20 or 30 years um, the standards change and we all like to think of the good old days which probably weren't that good and old. Um, because you know, if you look at public water supply that's there for protecting um, health, public health, wastewater systems, um, sewer systems, treatment systems are there to public health again and the environment one way or the other and you can have an argument all year long about what that actually means but 
community um, what they think, what they want to pay for, or maybe not what they want to pay for, but what they want to see changes over time and it gets reflected in the permitting. So uh, to use in the New Zealand example, 30 or 40 years ago, our municipal, we're, we're an island, we got lots of sea around us, great place to dump um, municipal uh, wastewater. We used to, 40 years ago, dump it out to sea with no treatment at all. Um, and then people go, hey, well, no, that's not really where we want to be, is it? And so you get some new permitting and, hey, we've got to put in some primary treatment, then secondary treatment, then tertiary treatment, and ultimately we'll get to the point where we're UVing it and, and it's, all, it's basically almost a drinking water standard and then going out to sea. And that reflects a shift in the thinking of the wider community about what's acceptable practice, and the same thing happens with, with water supply as well, um, fresh water. Um, and that then reflects in the regulations. Uh, and so I think one of the things from an asset management point of view is you have to recognise that these are changes in service levels, and they change over time as the permitting changes. Um, better to stay ahead of it than to fight it, I think, uh, and just have those conversations with your communities and say, hey, look, you know, nationally, uh, federally, we're, we're moving to this position. Sometime in the next 5, 7, 10 or 15 years, we're going to have to be there whether we like it or not. Uh, what can we do to do this in a really intelligent and, and structured way that gets us to where we know we're going to need to be? And um, I, I know because I read about what happens in the US. In New Zealand, it's the same. Some of our small communities go, we, we hate this, we want to now have a, take our water supply back from the municipality and have our own supply because we don't want to, um, th these regulations are onerous and we, and we don't like them and we don't want to pay for them and all those sorts of things. Those are community conversations. Um, these same areas, you, you, and you've got to have those conversations, but at the end of the day, the overall level of what the community finds acceptable does change over time. Um, I would never want us to go back to uh, well, you know, some some developing countries in the world where you know your wastewater runs down the, the side of the gut, the road and you you go to a contaminated well um, and have cholera and typhoid and those sorts of things. So you know that that's a long time ago in in American and New Zealand history, but it was there at one stage, and that's why you started putting in these sorts of systems to protect. So so we're now building on those foundations, and it will get better over time. And another aspect of the strategic direction or that strategic look is even looking at the wastewater discharge as a resource as opposed to a, you know, something you're trying to get rid of, you know, a yeah. bad thing. So a lot another, of work going on in that area, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, another possibility is, you know, are there um, people who would want that water for irrigation, for example, or can it be used to supplement an aquifer or, you know, what else could you do with that wastewater besides discharging it to the receiving body, is there any other options? And there's certainly a lot of talk now about, you know, um, re wastewater reuse, whether it's direct or indirect. Um, so there's different ways of doing that where you discharge it into an aquifer and then pull it back out, or you create water that's good enough to uh, consume in the household or blend together with your drinking water resource. So another way to think about it might be if you're creating a really good effluent because the tertiary requirements make you, then looking at that in a different way and seeing it not as a disposal problem but rather a resource issue, like, oh, is there a resource that we could use some other way? You know, is there a farmer that would want it for irrigation? Is there, you know, um, a, a industry or business that might want it? So you know, having that strategic look, maybe taking a different angle and, you know, since we have to do this and spend a lot of money, is there a way to recoup some of that money or, you know, use it in a different way? Yeah, and I mean, um, I'm sure you have the same thing here. We we have a few sites where they've got biodigesters and they're getting, um, you know, gas recovery off those and then running the vehicles off the recovered gas so just around the, the treatment facility and things like that. And so you start, and, you know, you start recovering energy as well. Um, through some of your processes, and instead of just letting it go to waste or flaring it, you can go, "Hey, right, we'll we'll do we'll do something different with that." And again, that's just an evolution of process and thinking. Um, and it, but it can be quite cost effective and a very short um, payback period for for the kit that you need to do that. So. Yeah, and then just, you know, again, that's sort of that getting away from the managing assets to the asset management thinking of, you know, if we're down in the weeds, we have to manage the assets that remove the nitrogen and phosphorus 
if we step back, we can take a different look and say, well, long term, you know, maybe tomorrow is not when we're going to do the change to, um, you know, potable reuse or something like that, but maybe five years or 10 years down the road. So as you take that step back, you take a different look and see if there may be something else you can do besides what you're doing now. Yeah, we should go back to Savannah. First. So uh, Savannah, any more questions coming in? There have not been any questions. Okay, so we'll go on to a different topic. Um, well, this sort of segues very nicely off what we were just talking about, doesn't exactly. it? Exactly. So another topic that came up at the conference I was at in Australia, and it's something that I've actually been thinking a lot about because it gets into this terminology and how important terminology can be. So there's a lot of talk right now about the need for more um, infrastructure replacement. And there are quotes anywhere from, you know, multiple hundreds of billions to trillions of dollars that are needed to replace infrastructure. And we've heard a lot of talk at the national and even in some states talking about investing in infrastructure. And the conversation that goes on is generally a positive one that if you invest in new infrastructure, that's considered to be a good thing. We're, we're making this investment. On the other hand, operation and maintenance, particularly maintenance, is considered a cost. And that's pursued as sort of a negative thing or portrayed as negative. So we're spending money to maintain assets, but we're investing money to rehabilitate or replace assets. So one has a negative con connotation, the other one has a positive, but the two are so tightly connected that we need to not do that because that drives us to think incorrectly. So for example, the more we operate and maintain our assets properly, hopefully the longer they're going to last doing what we want them to do. And if we um, forego some of that maintenance, our assets are going to have shorter lives, have to replace sooner, which would be a lot more expensive. On the other hand, and we don't want to be in a situation where we are spending you know, lots and lots of money inefficiently on maintaining an asset that really is past its useful life and should be replaced. So there's kind of a sweet spot there is. where our expenditures on O&M and replacement are right in line where we're spending you know, the appropriate amount on maintenance to keep the assets in good operating order, doing what they need to do, keeping them you know, maximum life, um, and then replacing them when it's the appropriate time to replace them. But I think some of this terminology of a cost versus an investment gets us thinking a little bit incorrectly about our assets. Instead of seeing them as a whole, where we're doing all of these things together and we're trying to find the optimal point to make the decision to replace, we get skewed into let's rip all the old stuff, quote, old stuff out, put in all new stuff, and life will be good again. Well, it won't be because we're not answering this question of the O&M. And, and we were having that conversation earlier this week around um, particularly uh, pre-World War II cast iron pipe, um, which is pretty good pipe. And um, yeah, the manufacturing processes were such that the wall thicknesses were pretty pretty big and you get a bit of tuberculation in, in it sometimes. But um, yeah, so that pipe's been in the ground 100 years nearly, a lot of it or more, and it's going to go at least another 100 years, uh, maybe longer, um, versus some perhaps more newer pipe materials that haven't lasted um, the distance at all. In New Zealand we've had that experience with asbestos cement pipe and we put a humongous amount of it in the ground after World War II as we built out our water systems and our and our cities and things like that. And um, But I think as well with this conversation here there is, is we're building assets with, when we, we're picking materials that have a hundred plus year lives uh, uh, in pipes and, and uh, even the concrete if it's not, you know, the, the water of concrete anyway, but yeah, uh, well, and you, I think one of the things you've got to look at as well is say what's the entire life cycle cost of this asset um, and if you skimp at the start and, and you put in, like I've, I've seen assets have gone in that should have lasted 100 years that went in wrong, pipes 20 years later you're replacing them, that, that's, just, that's just nuts. And uh, but it comes back to did you specify it properly? Did you did you get the right contractor or the right team to do it? Did they know what they were doing? Um, was it was it manufactured right? Was it was it put in the ground right? Um, and the temptation is always to do that on the cheap, 
and somebody pays for it further down the track. And if you're if you're a municipality or a water supply operator and you're going, okay, we, we're trying to get best long-term bang for the buck over that 100 years, uh, you want to make sure you get it right at the front end because you lock all your costs in then and you then want to make sure that you look at the mix of rehabilitation, replacement, operations and maintenance around how do I get the optimal costs over the 100 years. One of the things that's quite counterintuitive in there is you know, the best time to, to buy new assets is when the price is cheap. The price is cheap in the middle of recessions because everybody just wants to do some work. And But what tends to happen, or it certainly happened with us 10 years ago in New Zealand, is everybody went, oh, we've got no money. So they spent no money for a while at the time when the price in the, in the longer term would have been the cheapest it had been in 30 or 40 years because the contractors and the people building assets just wanted work. They didn't have any work on and just wanted to keep their crews going and pay the mortgage on the, on the gear and that was it. They weren't looking for a big profit. Um, and it's very, very counterintuitive to, to human psychology, but it's about buying assets smart, buying them at the right time, at the right cost, and then getting that mix, I think, as you were saying, between operations and maintenance and, and replacement and new, and new, invest, new capital investment, and, and getting that mix right. There's, not, there's no perfect, is there, but we could get it right or fairly close. Yeah, and I think one of the things that we need to keep in mind is replacement is oftentimes the most expensive solution. So if we have other solutions that are maintenance, we're actually doing the more efficient, more effective, um, and you know, using an asset management program would tell yeah. you that's the right way to go. But when we get caught up in this, you know, again, the terminology of, in people's psyche of, oh, investing in new stuff, that's good. Maintaining old stuff, that's bad. We're spending money. Uh, we just really need to think about, you know, terminology. And if anybody out there has some thoughts of, you know, have you done this? Have you changed the mindset? You know, please type it in the chat box or even later on, you know, get in touch with us. I'd love to hear your stories um, and, you know, email us or whatever because it would be great to hear, um, you know, how do you change the dynamic and look at it as both of them are important and necessary but done at the right time the right way. Uh, one story I heard because I often tell people that part of the problem with maintenance is there's no ribbon cutting and people love to cut ribbons they love to put on the big show get all the politicians the governing body out there cut you know the big red ribbon with the big scissors and make a big fanfare and how do you do that with maintenance? Because maintenance is not that kind of thing. You know, we're not going to cut a ribbon to wipe somebody, you know, pour oil in a pump or something. But this one particular utility mentioned something I thought was really cool. They were doing some pipe, um, you know, you best call it pipe repair because it was just putting in a couple of segments here and there. It wasn't yeah. a big, long piece of pipe, so it wasn't a replacement project. It was more of a rehabilitation or repair type pro program. And they said what they did is actually took the piece of pipe they're putting in, had all the people sign their name on the pipe, and then, you know, inserted it in the ground so that it was kind of like a ribbon cutting sort yeah, of a that's thing. Good. And I thought, well, that's kind of a cool idea. And then we were talking and somebody mentioned, oh, it'd be kind of cool to have people put handprints on the pipe, like get some, make sure you use a paint that would be okay. But dip your hands in paint and put some prints on it. So think of some creative ways yeah, to make like, uh, O&M a little more exciting. If you did that, like in a thousand years, somebody's going to go and try and replace that pipe, and they're going to go, "Oh, look, you know, there's, 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 there's an O. Oh, no, it's an Aka. You know, and that, that that could hold the whole program." Up. Savannah, how are we going on those questions? So there have not been any questions submitted yet. Okay. So if you're out there listening and you have any thoughts, please uh, type them in. We'd love to hear what you, uh, if anybody has solved this problem a little bit or if anybody has any thoughts of new terminology because I think that's, um, uh, you know, one of our, our, our issues with asset management, and this has come up as well, is terminology, like getting everybody sort of on the the same page with terminology, like, well, for example, the asset management versus managing assets or O&M as an investment as well. Um, there's lots of terminology, level of service, criticality, yeah. risk, and having a terminology that, that we kind of agree as, you know, an industry out there that everybody understands what you mean by different 
different words, I think is probably one of our our uh, goals is to get the terminology out there and get it, you know, getting people's understanding up about the terminology. Yeah, and, and just sort of like coming back to this um, thought about balancing off um, the either building new assets or repairing them or operating and maintaining them, coming back to that discussion about uh, changing standards over time, particularly the environmental um, and or quality and safety standards. One of the things that's been happening in New Zealand, and bearing in mind we've been doing asset management for 20 plus years now, um, there's a natural temptation when you've got a big upgrade program for a treatment plant coming along to, to push it out a little bit in the planning cycle so that it doesn't skew the numbers and scare everybody. Um, and so originally um, we were producing we, we have a three-year political cycle in New Zealand, so 10 years is three political cycles. It would be like a 12-year sort of planning for you, for here. Um, and people would always put stuff in year 13 or year, year 11, so the year after, the really scary stuff. And, and now um, the, 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 our regulators and our, our federal government have got a little bit wise to that, so now they're saying, hey, you have to go out 30 years, so 10 political cycles. Uh, in your case, that would be 40 years here in the U.S., so the, it's a bit harder to, to hide this stuff. Um, but one of the things is, is if you've got a really big environmental standard related upgrade coming out at year 30 or 40, that can change the way you're going to configure your networks to meet that and, and or other, other works. Or, um, and that can then have impacts on your rehabilitation replacement programs and or your operations and main, you've got to operate and maintain things, but you might choose to sequence the work a little bit differently to get everything ready for for that change. Sometimes, um, so we, we've got coastal erosion on some of our coasts, and so one of my clients has got a, a big wastewater treatment um, plant that's actually could be inundated within 30 years um, through coastal erosion and and a bit of sea level rise and uh, so the conversation we're starting to have is well do we put into the planning that we're going to have a hundred million buck replacement of this this plant and we're going to move it and then if we are going to move it what does that do to the rest of the system um, and it's really good to have those sorts of conversations really early because otherwise you could end up doing a whole lot of asset replacement to a plant that actually isn't going to be there in, a, in 20 years time um, and it's getting that, that bigger picture planning going that helps inform your, your shorter term, say, three to ten year decision making. Uh, and that ties right back into our managing assets yeah, versus definitely. asset management conversation because yeah. if we're just focused on managing that treatment plant, we may make a huge investment in, you know, replacing something or, or dealing with those assets when we're going to take them out and move mm. them, you know, five or ten years down the road. So in that case, um, and I actually worked with a utility that was in a situation where it was a hotel, but it was a water utility that served this hotel. And they were looking at selling the hotel and not being in the hotel business in about a seven-year period. Right. So that completely changed the way they were operating and maintaining that system from when we had visited them a couple of years prior and that wasn't the goal at that point, but now they were going to change and they were kind of at this point where we're only going to be here seven more years. So that completely changed the dynamic at the strategic level of where do you make your investments. You can't ignore the system. You still have seven years. Yep. But your strategic investments might look a little bit different because you're not going to get and replace not, all those pipes. So you right, might we're just not going to replace pipes. Decide to maintain and, them. Um, so, yeah, we're going to make different choices O and M wise versus replacement. Only replacing the key, absolutely necessary stuff. So again, looking at it, you know, in a more strategic direction from their perspective, you know, we're not going to be doing this in you know after seven years. So let's manage the system with that as you know, an ar overarching sort of um, thing that we have to work with, and then that changes how you do things. If you're just at the asset level again, you would continue to maintain yeah. each asset as you were before, and you wouldn't have that big picture look. So again, the big picture gives you a chance to say, well, will I change anything at the individual asset level given the big picture that I have? So um, that's, again, you know, just can't stress enough how important it is to have both, to have that 
big picture look and then, you know, a focus on what should be the asset management uh, or um, operation and maintenance tasks that you do on an individual asset. So to have both is a really key key feature. Yeah, and look, um, it calls to mind a, a, a quite a small um, town uh, in New Zealand that was um, maybe 3,000 population, and but they supplied water to a massive big milk processing plant uh, that was located in their town. So half the, the supply, or more than half, was just going to this, this treatment plant. Uh, sorry, the, the, the milk processing plant, big industrial plant. A lot of the income for the town was coming through that plant. And I said to them, well... Um, do you know what they want and what what they what changes they've got? Oh no. Well, do you talk to them? Oh, we haven't talked to them in five years. Oh, okay. Um, I just said to them, look, you know, because I, I do consulting. I said if if I had one client that was fifty percent of my my income, I suspect I would talk to them more often than once every five years. I said, yeah, that's a really good idea. We should go and talk to those guys and find out if they're going to be growing, if they want more water off us, and are they got any changing standards and. And so I think one of the things is, you know, just being aware of what's changing around your town. A big new healthcare facility could create new demand or a whole lot of new infrastructure that you need to get there. Um, a, a big industrial process coming into your area could change stuff, particularly if you're supplying them and um, or, or taking stuff from, you know, wastewater out of there. Um, and you just got to stay on top of that sort of stuff. And that means that you've got to keep your ear to the ground and keep talking to the people that are in charge of those sorts of decisions uh, and and that helps inform again it might change the way you think about how you're managing your network uh, we're going to need new big new parts of it um, it can change a lot of stuff quite quickly uh, in you know any community that hey somebody's going to come spend two or three or four hundred million dollars on a big healthcare facility you're not going to say no normally you want to be saying, "Hey, how do we how do we make that happen, and um, how do we how do we facilitate that?" But it can change your asset mix in the in the process as well. Uh, just uh, let's do a check in with Savannah. Savannah, any questions? Yeah. So an attendee did ask um, if you or Ross has any recommendations for integrating, um, changing, mostly declining per capita demand patterns. And that is actually a dynamic. The declining demand patterns on a per capita basis is something we're seeing almost nationwide. I won't say absolutely every community because nothing is ever absolute. But we're certainly seeing a decline in per capita usage across the entire country. And a couple of dynamics are causing that. One is the water efficient devices that you can't buy the water hogging toilets anymore unless you're on the black market somewhere. Uh, is, so, is there a black market for water <laughs> hogging toilets in the U.S.? One hopes not, but no? you know, you never know. No? Um, so we have, you know, people using low flow toilets, people using low flow shower heads, you know, more efficient washing machines, more Appliances, efficient dishwashers, yeah. all that sort of stuff. So just in general, not even changing any aspect of your life, you're going to use a lot less water because toilets actually end up being one of the primary drivers of water use. Yeah. And people putting in like water water gardens that need less water and things like that. Yeah, you know? so people are, are being much more aware. So just even without a really serious conservation program, people use less water. The other dynamic we had is if you remember back a few years ago, the whole country at one point or another was in drought. Yeah. And in my neck of the woods here in New Mexico, that's kind of our life forever. But in other parts of the country, the Northeast, the Southeast, the Midwest, those are very uh, cyclical. You know, there'll be a drought that'll last, you know, a couple of months, but then you're going to get out of it. There's going to be some rain starting. But in those drought periods, people start using less water. And there was actually a pretty big one in, you know, Atlanta area, you yeah. know, around there where the reservoir was really greatly impacted. So people start using less water because they have to conserve this resource. And when the cyclical drought ends, so to speak, and the rains come again, they people don't go yeah. all the way back to where they were. So maybe reduced by 30%. When it's all over, you're back up 20% higher, but now we still have a net 10% drop. So there is definitely, you know, we're seeing this per capita decline. I think in the western states it's a little bit, greater decline than the eastern states, but it's certainly declining. And that has 
huge, huge implications for how you manage your infrastructure going forward. And that's one of those assumption yeah. questions. Yeah. You know, going Definitely. back to this idea of we make assumptions as we plan, and if we don't check those assumptions, we can get ourselves in a lot of trouble. So if we assume, you know, that demand is either going to stay the same or increase on a per capita basis over time, we might plan we need a bigger reservoir, we need another well, we need to buy our water rights, whatever it is, and that may be a really bad assumption. So it we costs need, you a huge amount of money. Yeah, it costs a lot of money. But but that whole declining um, consumption as well, I mean, you've got fixed costs in the, in the front end of the system, you've got fixed sunk costs in terms of the assets. So if, you, if you've got a system and then you're selling less water, um, that's going to hammer you in terms of your cost structure and uh, your ability to recover. Uh, you're either going to have to put your, your tariff or your rate up um, or, or whatever you're going to have to do. None of it's going to be popular. Now, I'm, from memory, I think EFC Network's got some tools to help people with that, haven't they, in terms of that rate trade-off analysis with, with change? Yeah, there's um, actually the, you know, the efcnetwork.org website that Savannah referenced. There are quite a few resources available on the financial side and the asset management side uh, where you can look at your rates. Um, there's tools up there, free tools. Uh, we also provide free assistance. So if you're out there and you want help looking at your rates in the age of declining use, yeah, yeah. Um, that's a good thing to do because that is part of asset management, that long-term funding. And again, you know, you look at the assumption that was made 50 years ago that we're going to grow at a certain rate, we're going to have a certain increase in per capita usage, and then that turns out not to be what happens, you know, 20 years later. Now it's time to take a step back and say, how does that change our funding picture? How does that change our infrastructure picture? You know, maybe we had a long-term vision. We're going to drill a new well every 10 years. Well, maybe we don't need to do that. Yeah. You know, maybe we can take a step back. Or, again, thinking of your neighbors, you know, is there a way to perhaps provide water to a neighboring utility and bring them into your, your facility as a collaboration? Like maybe there's a small utility that would really like to get out of the water business. Well, could you provide your water to them and maybe – you know, collaborate with them, bring them into your system. So thinking, again, big picture, like what are all your options as the declining um, usage happens? What are your options for how to address that? What can you do? Um, what are creative things that you might think about? Or could you sell water to an industry? To Could it be used for irrigation for farmers? Is there anything else you can do? Um, and again, presuming you're not living in an area where you really, really have to conserve resources like, you know, California, New Mexico, parts of Texas, that sort of thing. But in areas where you have a fairly robust resource base, you know, looking, taking a step back again and looking at a bigger picture of what are other options. You know, we kind of get tunnel vision sometimes and we can only think one way and only think about doing things a certain way and taking that tunnel vision off and kind of opening it up, what else could we do? How else could we bring, you know, revenue into our system? Because uh, you have to have a certain amount of money to survive. Well, that's the sustainability of, um, of revenue. Um, yep. And if you, if you get on the wrong side of that and you, your expenses are higher than what you're able to recover, you, you're going to be in trouble pretty quickly. Um, I'm so, I was just wondering when I was listening to that too, I was like, you know, Back in the day, the young people would, would go and spend time in the shower, and now it's a you know, five-day you know, online gaming fest and, and you know, two minutes in the shower so I can get back on Snapchat. And I'm sort of wondering, Heather, you know, is, that, is that a trend here where you know, maybe the, the two-hour shower of the young person is a thing of the past, and now it's like one and a half minutes uh, once a week just, to, just to, because life is too exciting. So. Well, that'd be a really good question. I can only uh, suggest from my experience with my children, I think the longer showers are still part of their lives, but oh, well, it's perhaps it possible that in other places uh, yeah, people are seeing a Maybe reduction. that could be a research project for yeah, somebody. Exactly. So, yeah. Good science fair project. Uh, Savannah, do we have any more questions? Yes, we did yes, just we receive, did a receive a question. An attendee asked, how can our system encourage utility staff to implement and sustain business workflow processes associated with asset management and the acronym CMMS? Especially in cases when systems feel existing workforce is insufficient for day-to-day -day tasks, much less additional asset management duties. 
So one thing I always like to dispel a myth that what we're talking about with asset management is adding to your workload. So there may be blips where you have to do something, like if we're going to do an inventory, we may have to spend some time getting inventory information. But what we're really hoping to do is get on the other side of that and make your life better. So instead of everything being a crisis, we plan much of your day so that in the end of doing asset management, you're not looking at it as extra tasks that I must do. So thinking like, well, I have three people now, and if you make me do asset management, I need five. That may or may not be true, depending on you know how those people are being used. But the point is not that if we do asset management, you're going to have to need you know six people who are going to do the asset management. It's that we want to change what your day looks like so that we can do more planned, less reactive stuff. And I'll give you one example of a community we worked with very recently. Um, they were looking for assets and the assets are buried very deeply. It's very hard to find them. So how do you find assets in those locations? You don't have a map. You don't have a GPS location. Well, it's a long, arduous process. So you have to find paper records. You have to talk to people. You have to get a metal detector. And all of that takes time. Who has the metal detector? We've got to go track that down. Oh, it's in Bob's truck. Well, where's Bob's truck? It's on the other side of town. We've got to drive over there. So by the time you get all your resources together to look for your assets, it can take you maybe one to four hours to find the asset that you're trying to work on. What we would like to do, one little tiny piece of asset management is know where your assets are. So now if we need to find that particular asset, it's less than a five minute task. So either you're going to a well done paper map if you're a very small utility or you have some kind of geographic information system map where you can click on an asset and it tells you it is right here. Now I have just saved anywhere from one hour to four hours of my day that I didn't have to spend looking for an asset. If that happens to you twice a week even, it's good saving. you've saved anywhere from two to eight hours. So you've created a whole day potentially of an operator's time. So what we hope to do is in making things more efficient for operators and managers, you create time that then allows you to do other activities like additional maintenance, um, the strategic thinking, uh, you know, working with your CMMS system to look at data and make better decisions. So there's lots of things you can do with that time savings, but, but what we don't want to do is to say, well, if you're going to take on asset management, go hire five more people. It's we want to look at what you're doing and how you're doing it. All the CMMS vendor and ten of their people. Right. I, I think this thing with C, I, I do. I've done a lot of work with CMMSs over the last twenty years, um, and in fact, the International Infrastructure Manual. I write on the section all for that section and the the data management section. Um, they can become beasts. Those systems, and if you if you <coughs> Often you'll have a vendor that's trying to sell you their system that will solve all your problems, as, as usually the, the sales pitch. And, um, yeah, you'll get told you have to feed them with all sorts of information. And I, and I think you can get just like the hamster on the treadmill with that stuff. You can spend countless hours feeding them and, and you, you don't um, necessarily get what you want out of the other end. And I think that the, there's two very good pieces of advice around that. One is keep it very simple initially and the second is start small, do a pilot program or a little a little part of your utility and prove the concepts and make sure that you're getting the answers that you need out of the system. Um, we've had experience where a, a municipality has spent several years checking a huge amount of resource uh, at, at completing a CMMS. Um, made lots of assumptions along the way uh, at the end of the day. They didn't really know what they were trying to, the questions they were trying to answer in the first place, so they collected the wrong information. Um, it gets a bit expensive, it gets canned, or, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's small, simple, uh, get get the answers, refine, keep going. That, that sort of loop um, will get you a long way down the track. Um, and the other thing is, like, every every manager and, and uh, your governance uh, board or, or a council, whoever, uh, they like wins. So if you can if you can do a nice little small pilot and you can go, hey, look, we we just managed to save you know 
however much money it is in your terms, hundreds, thousands or thousands or millions of dollars, depending on the size of your utility. Um, they go, well, well, hey, that's good. Look, let's keep investing in that. But then you've got some, some certainty about the value you're getting out of it. Um, the real risk of somebody's coming and selling you a big system and you're going to try and feed a whole lot of stuff into it and redefine all your workflows so it works for their system and all that sort of stuff is you'll just never get there. Um, and you don't have wins, you just have a resource drain. Um, and then again, it goes back again to that strategic thinking. Is mm. Many, many communities will go buy one and you say, well, what were you trying? They'll say it didn't work. Yeah. I hear that a lot. Well, that system didn't work. And say, well, why didn't it work? Well, it didn't do you know, X, whatever X is. And you say, well, what did you want it to do at the beginning? Well, we just bought one. Yeah. So the trouble is a lot of times we don't think about at the beginning, the front end, <clears throat> what is it you want your CMMS or GIS or any other computer tool you're using, what is it you want it to do? Is it just to store information? That's one thing. Is it to keep track of maintenance tasks? Is it to make it able to... Um, figure out the cost of maintaining a particular asset, you know, whatever it is, thinking through those questions up front, you know, what data do I want to get out of it, what report would I want to be able to produce, what question do I want to answer, can drive you to get the right system, because oftentimes it's like what Ross was talking about, where you're fitting to the system instead of the system fitting to you. So you're, you're, you're trying to answer questions they want you to ask, but those aren't the questions that you want to ask. So you're kind of stuck with the wrong system. And if you would have thought about it up front, you might have made a different choice. Maybe it was a simpler system or a different kind of system well, or whatever. Just to use an analogy, let's just pretend or remember when we're back at college and we've got no car park and we've got to get to college. And so you you could, you got a choice. So you say, hey, well, look, the best way is to get a bike or a scooter or something like that, and, and I can then put that in the bike rack and lock it up. But but the person who sells you a, a great big pickup, and so you're driving this pickup in the college every day, it's costing you a fortune. You couldn't really afford it in the first place, and you've got no park. So you're paying a fortune for parking, and you go, well, it didn't work. The pickup, oh, I love my pickup, but, but, um, but it's not the right tool for the job I'm trying to do right at the moment um, and maybe if you if you later on you might need to pick up but um, I think systems are like that and, and I still come back to like um, some of the most effective work that I've seen Heather do has just been with small utilities and are just a really simple GIS and a couple of simple fields get going get some answers going get the, the investment targeted uh, start building a more accurate inventory um, don't don't go and buy the pickup when you just need a bicycle uh, and a lot of times communities get really caught up in the 50,000 things that this tool can do. Oh, yeah. And you don't really need to do them all. If you're a smaller to you know, medium-sized utility, some of that stuff you're not even going to have the data to make it work. So you really have to think about would you actually use that? So yeah, it could have 50 bells and whistles in it, but if you're not going to use any of them, you're paying for stuff you're not going to use. And then the other problem is technology moves so really fast. quickly that you invest in a system. We just talked to somebody very recently who said, you know, I invested in this asset management software, and two years later, they're not supporting the software anymore. Mm. So now I'm kind of stuck where I've got the software that I can't even use, and they've told me I've got to buy a new software and pay money to get that customized to me because that software is obsolete two years what, what later. What a wonderful position to be so, in. A horrible position to be in. So what you want to be careful about is thinking maybe 20 years from now I would like those functions, but I don't think I can use them now. Well, don't invest in today's technology for something you might do 20 years from now because technology will have moved on, and maybe that's something you don't want to do at all, or maybe it could be done so much better with some other piece of software so don't get real caught up in stuff you're not going to do today and buying this really grandiose system for 10, 20 years down the future. Keep it more focused on what it is you want to do today and then you know, yeah. build into your future over time. In the international manual, because I, uh, I wrote that section, I put this really little simple um, guideline in there. And, and the first part for any type of CMMS and um, implementing it is you've got to have your management and your government sign off on the purchase, the ongoing maintenance and the resources needed to, to run it. 
um, and that they've got to give you a clear direction about what they want out of that. And if you don't have that, the temptation, I've done this myself several times, um, the temptation is to go, oh, look, those guys don't know what they're doing, let's just get on with it. Um, you'll run out of resources and you run out of money, even if you're cribbing it from other places. The, the second thing, once you've got that sort of uh, organisational agreement where you're going, the, the, the really important thing is what do I want out of it? So what outputs do I need from that system? And you can make a list of those quite quickly. Uh, it could be tracking your maintenance, it could be tracking your inventory, it could be doing some analysis of some description, but be really clear about what outputs you want. Once, you, once you've done that, so I've, I've got the, the sign-off for resources and, and money from governance and we're clear about that. We, we, we're in agreement as an organisation about what outputs we want out of the system. Then work out the inputs that you need to put into that system. So to get my outputs, what do I need? What information do I need? Um, what data do I need? Uh, what inspections do I need? What other information? Have I got it? Where am I getting it from? Can I reliably get it? Uh, have I got those sorts of things. Then, then after that, you go, hey, well, have we got the business processes in place to get those inputs into the system or to even get the inputs in the first place? Inequality, so the quality systems around that, the, the, the understanding of the consistency of input. Once you've got all that sorted, then go look for some software. That's the last step. And, and in New Zealand, we had know from bitter experience and millions and millions of dollars of wasted money because we've all done it several times. You go, oh, there's this nice shiny piece of software. I like that. Mm. And the salesperson, my friend, um, well, they, of course they're like your friend because you're going to keep them in, a, in an income for a little while. Um, and they, you go and buy a, a, the, the shiny new knife or whatever it is, the shiny new spanner, um, that great big pickup that you don't really need. And it doesn't get, you, doesn't get the job done. And I think when you start working your way back through a structured process like that, you'll, you'll then get a lot of clarity. And maybe at the end of that, you go, hey, actually we need a much bigger system than we were thinking of. Maybe the system that somebody's trying to show you is ideal once you've done that thinking. But I think if you do, if you step through those, those, those simple steps, you will be in a reasonably good place to make good decisions. And that's part of your asset management planning at the end of the day. And then uh, one thing I always caution people about is um, a CMMS system or even something called asset management software mm. or asset inventory software. You know, there's different names that people call their, their product. Don't ever get into the thinking that that is asset by management. itself <laughs> asset management. So that is not asset management. That is a tool. It is a wonderful tool or could be a wonderful tool to help you but it can't do it for you. So any salesperson who tries to tell you, you buy my software, it will do asset management for you, that's not the case. You have to do the thinking. You have to think yourself. You still have to provide the strategic direction. You still have to set levels of service. You still have to be an integral part of the whole process. So the data you get out helps you make these decisions. But it is not by itself asset management. So again, don't get caught up in buying like a more grandiose product thinking, well, if I buy that, that does my asset management for me. And the training you guys have been doing for years now, that, that's around equipping people to, to get that picture and do that thinking, isn't it? So. Absolutely. And one of the things that we offer is a free access database and a free Excel spreadsheet. There's nothing magic whatsoever about them. But it's a place that people can start. And I'll often say, start with that. Get your feet wet. See what kind of information you might want to have. You know, once you put it in a spreadsheet or an access database, you can start looking for, you know, I wish I was collecting this other yeah. information. And that leads you to down the road then say, well, out of the 20 pieces of data we collected, I only use five of them or oh, wow. 10 of them or one of them or whatever yeah. that is. So when you again go to look for something more robust if you like to go that route you can focus on what you've actually used instead of shooting in the dark and saying well you know my eyes are lit up because there's 60,000 things this program can do and you're probably not going to do most of them because it's too hard it's too hard to keep the data in there and keep it current and fresh if you get too grandiose with what you're trying to do you kind of lose the forest for the trees sort of thing so um, just be cautious that way. And then the question also mentioned business practices. Make sure you do have some written standard operating procedures for how does data get in the system? Who yeah. does it? Who can 
read into the system, who can write into the system, who can make changes, and how do you fix information that's wrong? You know, I always tell people it's okay to be wrong the first time. We all are going to be wrong in our databases, our CMMS, whatever you have the first time, the map. It's not okay to be wrong the second time. Because no, once you when, find out... when you're wrong the tenth time. Then. Right. <laughs> that's, that's not learning quickly. But so once you have you know, this, this information, you've got to have a business practice for how do I get that fixed? You know, whose job is it? How's it going to be done? And, and then, look, I think one of the things with this whole whole process as well is that uh, people go, hold up the crews. The guys in the crews will get all the information. You know, they'll do condition ratings and they'll, they'll get, get all their asset inventory for us and they'll tell us, you know, all the time that they're going up. But they probably don't want to do that. They like being on the tools and actually doing the physical work. And so you, you force them to do it. And they go, okay, look, the officers, the engineers want us to do this, so let's let's see whether they're reading this stuff. So the first month, they'll fill these forms out, but they, they will put in the comments, you know, look, like Bob and I went to fix this valve and there was an alligator there and uh, it bit Bob's leg off and it, while he was bleeding to death, we, we managed to change the flange and, and we put a we, we put a hydrant there at the same time just, just because we, we, we wanted to and it cost $100,000. And they put that, they submit that. And it goes into the CMMS and you, and you go, oh, good, we've got a record that they did some work. And nobody looks at it. And they and they know, because they've written this great big story that nobody's ever going to look at, that nobody's looking at it. And then you end up 10 years down the track, somebody says, oh, we're going to analyse all these records. And what you find out is that everything's average and everything's general and everything's on the general maintenance code. And if you're lucky, there's a, there's a, a maybe you've put in a thing that's got a GPS on it and you've actually got a position. But you have unusable data because they've worked out pretty quickly that nobody's looking at it. And so they'll do what you force them to do to get paid, but that nothing more. And that just happens time and time and time and time again. Um, same thing happens with the inventory stuff. And so then you realise, ah, we've got a lot of, we've got a database that has information in here that's not as good as it could be, to be polite. Uh, and then what do you do with that and how do you rectify that? And so over collecting or forcing the wrong people to collect the information um, without any training uh, is just going to get you into a world of pain later on. So it looks like we're about at, out of time and I want to turn it back to Savannah for her to wrap up things but I want to thank Ross so much for being here um, all the way from New Zealand. We're so glad to have him and it was such a nice conversation today. Uh, we will record the webinar so if you ever want to listen to it again or you have colleagues that you would like to listen to all or part of it, it will be up on the EFC Network website. Um, give us about a week, I think, to put it up. Um, but you can always listen to it or share it with somebody. And so I will turn it back to Savannah for any closing remarks. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. And for attendees that did not have their questions answered, we will be following up with you offline via email. Now, quickly, before we close out for today, I do have two more quick polling questions. And the first one is, if you would like to subscribe to the Environmental Finance Center blog, if you want to sign up for the blog but do not have the opportunity to submit your polling answer today, you can sign up for the blog on the efcnetwork.org website. And I'm getting ready to close that poll in three, two, one. And lastly, if you are interested in receiving in-depth technical assistance for a small water system serving 10,000 or people served, <laughs> um, you can sign up for the technical assistance on our efcnetwork.org website. And you can also learn more about what technical ass assistance is if you're unsure about it. I'm getting ready to close that poll in three, two, one. And lastly, in the chat box, there is a survey link coming out to you all. If you could just take five minutes to let us know how you thought today's session went, that would be great. Um, and lastly, I just want to thank Heather and Ross for providing their expertise on asset management and thank all the attendees that joined us today. Heather or Ross, can I throw it back to you for any additional closing comments? Uh, again, thank you so much for being with us today. We really appreciate everybody who signed on. Uh, remember, we're happy to answer questions or, you know, the Environmental Finance Center Network has a lot of resources for small utilities, um, less than 10,000. We have a lot of tools 
Um, so, you know, please peruse the Environmental Finance Center Network.org website as well as the Southwest EFC .unm.edu website, and you can always find us by just searching for Southwest EFC or Southwest Environmental Finance Center. We're generally the first thing that comes up in Google. Um, so thank you so much for being here, and Ross, any final thoughts? I will be back. I continue to enjoy the uh, tremendous hospitality in New Mexico, and uh, we'll look forward to doing this again uh, next time I'm here. Yeah, so uh, again, thank you. We'll have another one of these scheduled soon. Um, so uh, have a good day everyone and thank you for being with us. Thank you Heather and Ross.